Again, we thank you so much for joining us at the Touching Hearts Ministries Church. Uh, we are a Bible-based church. Uh, the word, when we use the denomination, I really don't like to use that word. I believe that uh, there's only one. That's God's church, and that's who God's coming after. And I believe there are different, denom- there are different movements toward the end of time uh, that are moving and preaching and teaching uh, the Ten Commandment law, but also that being saved through faith in Jesus Christ and that the Ten Commandment law is more of a teaching device to, for us to follow Jesus. But we like to teach what the Bible teaches. And so that's what we're going to do today. Uh, we may expose some, some fallacies out there. Uh, I'm going to do it in a kind way, CJ, not necessarily a nice way, but a kind way, telling the truth. You know, sometimes the truth hurts. <laughs> it just hurts, but it's still truth. So we're going to talk about that today. But as always, before we go into the message, we have had a spirit-filled service already today. Our Bible study and our music and everything has just been wonderful. But I'm going to ask the Lord that will give me the words to speak today that someone might be encouraged, Rob, uh, or touch or gain some knowledge about the loveliness of the Jesus that I serve. So let's bow where we can. And those on the other side of the camera, I invite you to do the same. Lovely Jesus, we thank you, Father, for another day of life. We thank you for another opportunity to uplift the lovely name of Christ. And Father, I pray that someone will find you today. What a merciful and kind God that you are. And that someone will give their lives to you. And I know that once they do, everything about who they are will change today. Through the blood and the power of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for this message. Guide me and direct me, I pray. And in advance, I thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus, my best friend. Amen. Anyway, if you turn in your Bibles to Ephesians, the first chapter, verses 3 and 4. Ephesians, the first chapter, verses 3 and 4. And I'll read this scripture. You've heard this many, many times. But we have to remember there are many folks on the other side of the camera that have never heard these scriptures. And so I think, pray that God will open up and give us some light today. And here's what the Bible says, not what Donnie Shelton says. Here's what the Bible says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy. Now, when we go on to the next scripture, Here's the main thrust today, that we should be holy every day. Here's what I just said. Not once a week, not on Wednesday night service, not on Saturday or Sunday service, but every day that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. Now, let me break this down. The purpose of the plan of salvation is and was To restore the divine image in man, which was lost in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned. There was a time in history, as Adam and Eve were created and walked in the Garden, that they were in perfect communion. They reflected the perfect character of who God is and was. Is everybody with me? But the bad news is, Jen, (laughs) that the old devil came in and he separated us from God, by sin, and because of sin, my character became, listen, began to deteriorate. And I have taken on a carnal nature. I believe that Adam and Eve at one time had the same spiritual nature as the Heavenly Father. Now, let's go a bit further. Their spotless, stain-free, white as snow, righteous garments that they wore reflecting the pure and holy character of God, became stained with the act. Several different acts took place when this happened, when Adam and Eve sinned. Listen, the act of disobeying, lusting for power, then pointing fingers at the serpent, and then they began point fingers at each other, doing their best, listen, to rationalize and minimize the sin which had been committed. It's funny that when I do something bad, When somebody else does it, it's a lot worse. It may be the same one, but it's a lot worse when someone else does it. Now listen to this. Yet the stain of unrighteousness contaminated 
and permeated Christ's robe that they wore, Adam and Eve. Thus, a cleaning solution was needed for their spotted robes. You know where I'm going now? Listen, a cleaning solution. The only solution to wash their garment clean is the blood of Jesus Christ. <laughs> when I stand before God on Judgment Day, my robe will be spotless, wrinkle-free, as white as snow, because of what Jesus did. Now, the point of the matter is to keep my robe spotless and clean. It has to be purged and washed every day. Not just on Wednesday night. Not just when somebody sees me and I got to pretend. My robe has to be spotless and clean. And the only way that will happen if I'm living and spreading the gospel and working for Jesus on a daily basis. As I fall before the cross every night, I say, oh God, I don't know if you've done it, wash me clean in the blood of Jesus. And we have to have that spot-free, white as snow robe, which is the righteousness of Christ. Is anybody with me? Now listen to this. Their robes, when Adam and Eve sinned, Rob, immediately became stained. Spotted with sin, and only, let's make, we're going to go over this probably 20 times today. Only the blood of Christ can wash this robe. Only the blood of Christ can cleanse the stain of sin to the point that the robe is fresh, spot free, and clean, and pure, and holy. Come on, somebody. Whether we like it or not, the Bible tells Donnie he must live a holy life. <laughs> it didn't say part time. Didn't say you can rest, work for Jesus for two weeks, and then take a break. Come on. It didn't say that when I was nine years old, I give my life to Jesus and that I'm finished. Our sins have to be daily cleansed. Not a one-time deal. <laughs> it's a daily walk with Jesus Christ. Now, let's go a bit further. Now, I'm a, a lot of stuff I need to read today. Let's turn to 2 Peter 3.14. Here's, here's what the Bible says. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, here's what it says. Be diligent. Be earnest. Be persistent. That ye may be found in peace without spot and blameless when Jesus comes. In other words, we'll put it this way. Let me do this. Now, in the summertime, uh, it's a good time and it's a bad time for me. I got seven pieces of property that I take care of. Now, Mike, I know you probably have a lot more than all. I've got seven pieces of property. Now, every day when I head out to mow, load up the tractor and the trailer and all that, my clothes, even my jeans and my shirt, they're spot free. They're clean. But after working all day, toiling all day, the mud and the grass stain, and I'll say perspiration because that don't sound as bad as sweat. The perspiration leaves all these stains. So that night, Brenda has to take these clothes, and they have to be washed. Because if I don't, when I go up the next morning, I got, I'm already spotted, wrinkled, stains. Is anybody with me? It's no different with my life. Every morning, I wake up early, and I say, oh, God, it's a brand new day. Now, I slept through the war last night. There's a war going on, and I slept. But before I even climb out of bed, I need to be regenerated. I need to be revigorated. I need to be empowered with the Holy Spirit, and I need to be washed clean as I stay. Is anybody with me? Even in the physical realm, we must wash our laundry every day. In fact, we do about eight loads of laundry every day. Don't you? But they have to be done. If you don't, they're spotted. If you gave your life to Jesus when you were 10 years old and you say, I'm saved, I'm done, your garment is absolutely filthy. And it said that when I stand before God, I have to be spot free. It has to be a daily walk. And also, you want to serve God with all of your heart. Not half-hearted. Now, I can tell you, when Mike hires somebody in his construction business, if they're half-hearted in what they're doing, they won't be there long. <laughs> you, 
You want somebody to put into your business, and you know what? This is God's business. All of your efforts with everything that you have. Is everybody with me so far? Listen to this. Hebrews 9.14. Let's just turn there. Hebrews 9.14. Hebrews 9.14. Now, before I read that, I, I, this is what the S SDA commentary says. If you don't have an SDA commentary, you might want to get one. Here's what it says. Because in 2 Peter we read, Wherefore, beloved, you must be consistent, persistent in your walk with Jesus, that you may be found spotless. And here's what the SDA commentary said about that, Ben. The object of purification, I want to be purified, don't you? Is service. <laughs> the object of purification is to put you into a fit condition to be able to spread the gospel of Jesus. Right? Listen. Men and women are redeemed for service for Jesus. That's why you're redeemed. Listen to this. The cleaning or purifying is not the end in itself. It is, the commentator said, continual. It will be a continual process of refining in your life, purifying in the soul, that our ministry, our service, in spreading the gospel, the only way it can be acceptable is if I say, God, I tell you what, I, I, I'm limited. But I'm going to give you all that I have. And then, God, I need to be purified. I need to be sanctified. I need to be justified. And then I will be fit for your service in spreading the gospel for Jesus Christ. That's why, I, you know, people say, why was I born? You were born to be a soul winner for Jesus. That's what you were born for. Those on the other side of the camera, if you've just thought about, man, why was I born? You were born to be redeemed so God could put you into the service of bringing souls to Jesus Christ. That's why you were born. Can somebody get many men on that? Listen to this. Hebrews 9, 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to get, now listen, to purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Now, Jesus is spotless. I mean, <laughs> people say, oh, I tell you what, Jesus was an overcomer. He was tempted, and I mean, he struggled with it, but he was an overcomer. That's not true. When Jesus was tempted, he was tested. The devil was going to throw everything at him that he could. But I can tell you this, sin made him sick to his stomach. As John Ortberg said, it made Jesus want to just throw up. But because of Donnie Shelton, he didn't throw up. And he actually fought the nauseous feeling of being in a dark, sin world. Because you've got to remember, the Bible says that he was a holy thing. Come on. He was spotless. Let's go a bit further now. How much more? Shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, to purge your conscience. Now listen to that. Purge in the Greek. What does that mean? It means to make cleanse. It means to purify. Now let's turn to 1 John 1, 7. Those on the other side of the camera, if you know, if you got your Bible, get your Bible out. We want to turn to 1 John 1, 7. Here's what the Bible says. And I like this word, Bobby Joe. If. <laughs> Boy, that's a big word. If. But if we walk in the light of truth, if we are absolutely doing our best to live a Christian life through the power of the Holy Spirit, as Jesus is in the light, then because I'm doing all that I can do, Gary, through the power of the Holy Spirit, living a daily walk with Jesus, then I have fellowship, we do, with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. All sin. <laughs> now. God in his mercy. Up until Jesus came. The blood of goats and bulls. The re listen. The shedding of blood and using their blood. Cleansed the people from their sins. Up till Jesus came. Is anybody with me? So when Jesus died. What we have to remember. When Jesus died, His blood covered all of those before Him. <laughs> A goat's blood is worthless. I don't even want to drink it or eat it, do you? It is worthless. So all the sins that were committed before Christ, 
in the time of Christ and after Christ are all covered in the blood of Jesus, the spotless one. We want to make that clear. It's only through Jesus, not self-purification, not the priest, not Danny Shelton. It's all through Jesus and His works and His righteous robe that I am told to keep unspotted and clean. Come on, somebody. That's what the Bible says. Now listen to this. Let's turn to uh, Romans, the third chapter, verses 23 through 25. Romans, the third chapter, 23. Listen to this. And I like this. All have sinned. <laughs> Other than Jesus, everyone that's been born was even born into it. They have all sinned and we have all come short of the glory of God. Now, being justified, what's that mean? Being made right. Freely by His grace, I call mercy, through the redemption being bought back through Jesus Christ, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. Now, let's break that down before we go any further. For many years, I called it a propitiation, propitiation, I didn't know what that meant. But everybody else was reading it, so I read it. Here's what it means before I go further in that scripture. It means to look upon favor or to be appeased. Let me break that down. Through the faith in Jesus, through faith in the atoning blood of Jesus, because God looked upon the sacrifice of Jesus with favor, God was appeased that the blood of Christ, the blood of His Son, was permeated with love, it was permeated with grace and mercy, which leads to remission, justification, and sanctification in the lives of the redeemed. Because of Jesus' sacrifice, the propitiation, that's close enough, God said, that will do it. Ghosts won't do it. Bulls won't do it. No one can do it but the blood of Jesus. And God said, because my son shed his blood, Man is cleared of all guilt and, listen, and sin through the blood of Jesus. Come on. But again, I have to every morning take this robe of righteousness that's not even mine, that's Jesus, and wash it clean before I step out into the world, before I need to be washed clean and redeemed and filled with the Holy Spirit, before I can go out preaching the gospel of Christ. Before I can go teaching or singing, I must first be redeemed by the blood of Christ. And then, once I'm redeemed, if you are truly redeemed, Carolyn Jan, then you will want to walk the life of Jesus Christ. There'll be no, I did it 30 years ago. I'm covered. I'm done. I'm finished. There are so many, I know, have friends right now. They tell me they have been washed in the blood of Christ, they're filled with the Spirit, and that they are going to be in the kingdom, and yet their lifestyle has not changed one iota. They're still out in the bars. They're still out drinking and smoking and on drugs and commit adultery, but because they've been said, once saved, always said, they said, I, I'm in. Is anybody with me? Do you see the danger of that teaching that once saved, always saved? Instead of teaching... You need to walk with Jesus daily for the rest of your life. Now, that makes more sense to me. <laughs> wow. Let's go a bit further. Now, 1 John 1, 9, and we know the Scripture, but I'm going to read it anyway. 1 John 1, 9, and here's what it says. If we confess our sins, then God is faithful without question, beyond a shadow of a doubt, to forgive us our sins, and I like this here, to cleanse us, from all unrighteousness. You know why it says that for? It seems like I've done so many things. I don't even remember all the bad stuff. So when I go before God and say, God, you know, forgive me for my sins and I've done so many, I don't even remember what they were. So God, in your mercy, cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Come on. Now listen to this. Through Christ, our robe can be washed daily. We want to make, I'll keep saying that over and over. Through justification, Christ redeems us from the penalty of sin. Yeah, He does. Now, through sanctification, He delivers us from the power of sin. 
And at the same time, at the second coming, at the resurrection, then he will take me away from the presence of sin. And I don't know about you all, I'm just sick of it. Whew. <laughs> the, only, the only good thing I can see about going to bed at night and sleeping for four or five or six hours is I'm not in the war at that point because I don't know anything. <laughs> but as soon as I wake up, I think, oh man, I hear some clanging of the swords. Here we go. That's just the way it is. It's a war out there. Jackie Gleason, Dad, said it's a jungle out there. And there's animals and lions and tigers and bears everywhere out there to destroy you. Now listen to this. A daily walk. Now I'm going to read this to you, Doug, because you can sort of identify with this. To remain in good physical health. I don't know about you all. I must daily exercise. I have to eat a healthy diet. I'm supposed to drink plenty of water. God forgive me for that one. Stay away from alcoholic beverages. Stay away from unlawful street drugs. And get my sleep every night to stay in good physical health. Right? On the other hand, to remain spiritually healthy, I must feast upon the Word of God. I must exercise my faith. Then I must testify. I must attend church. I must spend time with my brothers and sisters in Christ. The daily spiritual walk is just as it says. Not once a day, once a week, intermittently, but consistently, constantly in communication with Jesus and the Father. If I'm not in constant communication, how will I ever know what God's plan for my life really is? Huh? <laughs> how am I going to know if I'm supposed to preach or teach or be still, be quiet? I mean, how am I going to know unless I am in constant, constant connection with the Heavenly Father? Now, in my daily life, to get all of my uh, order straight, I keep in constant contact with Brenda. So I know what I'm supposed to do all day. Mike, you know all about it. Doug, come on, you're quiet. Keep in constant contact. <laughs> sort of. Here's what it says in Romans 12, 1 2. This is one of my favorite scriptures here. Romans 12, 1 2. Paul said, I beseech you. I beg of you, listen to me. By the mercies of God that ye present your bodies a what kind of sacrifice? A living, walking Bible sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It just makes sense. Now, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God unless I have constant communication with Jesus how will I know what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God is everybody with me so far and I like this how do you be transformed by the renewing of your minds pick up the Bible for a change what do you say um, one of the teachers out of 3ABN Shelley Quinn says that the word has a way as you read of washing your mind of all the bad stuff that you've collected all day long. Because <laughs> whether you know or not, what you hear and see, it's in there. Whether it's good or bad. So the Word has a way of sort of washing out all of the impurities of this life. Is everybody with me so far? And listen to this. And it says, and you shall seek me. And here's what I love about the Heavenly Father. It says, if you seek me, I promise you, you will find me. If. Oh, that's a big word. If you search with, for me with all of your heart. In other words, Lord, right now, the paramount subject in my life is where I'm going to be after I die. <laughs> where am I going to be? It's very, very simple. If you're serving and living for Jesus on a daily basis, that when He comes and you're moving forward and you're working for Jesus with all your heart, you're going to be in the kingdom. Now, even Paul said this. I'm not perfect. But man, I'm working on it. <laughs> I, I see the finish line in Jesus. And I, I see the mark. And I'm working. I'm doing all that I can 
to be exactly what God wants me to be. And even Paul said, I'm not perfect. I have a work to do, but he said, I'm working on it. Can somebody give me amen? We need to be work. Now, here's the way I look at it. Now, I don't know. I'm throwing this out there. We look through a glass darkly. We can't see everything perfectly clear. But I just feel this way, and I have preached this, I know, 187 times. If I'm moving forward, not being settled down and getting comfortable, and I'm, I'm moving forward for Jesus, and I'm moving forward with all my heart, diligently, persistently, and consistently, even if I have more work to do and I should pass away, God's going to accept me. Because I was working. I was working on it. With all of my heart, diligently seeking God's will, even if I should pass away before I get there, come on, God's going to accept me. Because of Christ's righteousness, I'm going to be accepted. Listen to this. Again, one more time. Be not conformed to this world. Now, righteousness by faith. Let me read that. And we're going to talk about that scripture. Thank you, Linda. Just a second. Righteousness by faith means not only the forgiveness of sin, but also the newness of life. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God, and I love it, must believe that he is, and that he... <laughs> How many folks have you talked to say, oh, I believe in God? The devil believes in God. Is he going to be in the kingdom? Uh-uh. It says here that believe, and also he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You know what that means? As if your life depends on it, and it does. Diligently seeking him. No half-hearted, maybe I should, maybe I shouldn't. It's a, it has to be with all of your might all of your courage and all of your strength because if you're like me and you're around negative people it drains the courage out of you pastor Ortberg says stay away from negative people and i keep thinking where am i going to go to stay away from negative people you know even when i went into there there's a clinic I, uh, that i went to a couple of days ago it's like a health clinic and it said be positive positive." and i thought how could you be positive in a world like this i was already negative and it said, be positive. Is anybody with me? I'm the only one. All right, okay. Let's go a bit further. Now, daily walking with Jesus, Blake, includes sanctification, setting your life aside for Jesus, dedication, justification, transformation, and reconciliation. There's a bunch of goodies there. God's desire. I didn't say Jesus. I said God's because he... God and Jesus are on the same page. They think exactly alike. God's desire and God's purpose, God's will is to restore sinners, not kill them. <laughs> restore them. And it says here to restore them completely in their habits, their actions, and even in their thoughts. A complete transformation of character will take place, must take place, through a constant connection with Jesus. You see, God wants to even change my thoughts, my emotions, my feelings, my character. Here's what one author said. God has shown such great mercy in giving his son to die for sinners like me and in pardoning their rebellion that we should gladly devote our entire being into his service. Willing to be transformed through his spirit. And then Mike said, here's what it says. And then sharing the wonderful promises with all of those around us. Whatever we take, whatever we receive here, we take out there and give it away for free. Can somebody give me a minute? Every moment, what this guy writes, of every day can be an opportunity to go on Jesus. To share the gospel with neighbors. And this can be only done by a complete intellectual and physical and emotional and spiritual consecration to God. Those that are pretending to be Christian are living a horrible life. It's horrible trying to pretend to be something that you're not. That's why I say I can tell you all right now, Romans 3.23, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner saved by grace. For the wages of sin is what? But praise God, through Jesus Christ, I can have eternal life, even being a sinner. Come on, somebody. 
washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Now let's put this way. The true Christian worshiper presents himself alive with all of his energies and powers to be dedicated to the service of God. One writer said this, whether you're preaching or teaching or singing or testifying, do it with zeal and energy. If you love it, you will. <laughs> That's what you'll do. Listen to this. Let's put it this way. The God who so loved the world that He gave His only Son to sinners is well pleased when we turn from our self-destroying habits and give ourselves wholly and completely to Him without reservation. Here's what transformed means. Listen. is to be transformed into the image of Christ. That's what transformation is. Striving daily to be like Jesus. One scripture push, get rid of that fleshly mind. In Colossians 2.18, it says, to be transformed into the mind of Christ. The SDA commentary, again, it's what it said. It's what it said. This renewing change, which begins when the believer is converted, he's reborn, is a progressive, daily, and continuing transformation until Jesus comes. It's a continual transformation into the likeness of Jesus. Daily walk. Actually, it's not even daily. It's moment by moment. It's actually moment by moment. Listen to this. Jeremiah 29, 13. Let's turn to that. I'm skipping a couple here. Jeremiah 29, 13. If you have it in your Bibles. And I love this. Again, and you shall seek me and God said, and you will find me when you search for me with all of your efforts, your consistency, and your persistency of heart. I promise you, if you're true and you're truly repentant, God says you're going to find me. That's what God said. Wow. And that's why, uh, if you'll turn into Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verse 6. Blake, I have a few more minutes yet. Thank you. Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verse 6. We're going back to this faith now. Listen to this. But without faith again, it's impossible. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder. You know what? I'm, I don't know if it's... I want that reward. <laughs> I want it. <laughs> I can taste it. If you really want... I mean, if you want something, you have to really go out and get it, right? I mean, uh, Ben... Got him a beautiful car. When I opened the door, I thought, oh my, that's a beautiful car. But they, I tell you, the car lot didn't just look his name up in the phone book and bring it to him. He worked. And he put money aside. And he kept a good report among his creditors. Amen. And he put in hours of work. And that's what he, not only did he want it, he needed a new car. Right? It was only by God's grace the other car kept running. So he furnished him with a new one. But he wanted that, and he worked, and he got it. He, wa he was rewarded because of his work ethics. Come on. I want heaven. Here, a, a ministry called uh, the classroom. Seeking God requires a lot of focus. They said it requires a lot of daily effort. But the promise of the reward, this is what it says. Without faith, it is impossible. But with faith, I can move mountains. The psalmist writes, here's what it writes. Early I will seek thee, David said in prayer one morning. This carries the ideal that God is so important that we seek him before we do anything else in the day. Have you ever went out and done something without prayer and it just all fell in on you? You think maybe I should have prayed about that. Maybe I should have prayed. I can tell you this for a fact, and Brenda is, is the witness today. We talk about witnesses. I can come into the house with my cell phone in my hand, and in 30 seconds, I can't find it. It's just gone. I go through the house. I look under pillows and the bed. I accuse all the daycare children of theft. All grandchildren, thieves amongst us. I can't find it. And we will tear the house apart. And then she'll say, maybe I'll pray about it. And then there it is. Come on, somebody. <laughs> I can't keep track of my phone. There's something wrong with me. I need help. Come on, somebody pray for me. 
Quit pointing fingers and start praying. Now let's go a bit further. Early David said, God, will I seek you because you're the most important thing in my life. Now, let's turn to Matthew, the 16th chapter. Verses 24 and 25. And I don't know if I got that far with you as far as the scriptures. It was in, here's what Jesus said. Matthew 16, 24 and 25. You need to write this one down here. Then said Jesus to his disciples, If any man come after me, let him deny himself. And then take up his cross. And as one pastor said, we've all got different crosses to carry. <laughs> Yours might be heavier than mine, mine may be, and it may be of a variety, diverse different things. And then he said, once you pick up this cross, Jesus said, and he said, follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for me, he shall find life. That's what Jesus is saying right here in the scripture. Now, let's go a bit further. And it said, Jesus said, deny himself. It means to renounce yourself. Submit unto Christ. To love, if nothing else, but for the gospel's sake. Walking in the Christian realm instead of the secular world with all of his conceptions of life. You know, we had a very interesting Bible study this morning. And Rosemary said, we need to do all that we can. She said, the young uh, have left the church because their parents didn't teach them. And she said, we need to tell them the truth. But here's the problem with telling the young folks the truth. Ben and CJ, you can probably identify with this. In the secular world, the youngsters of the day, the 20s, 30s on down look at sin differently than what we did as we were taught they look at it different what the bible says in today's world it's okay to live with somebody without being married it's okay to have five or six different men come through your home am i with me it's okay to take your children and just leave them anywhere it's okay it's okay to sit around the house at night and have beer and wine right in front of your children because see in today's society it's okay one lady said, uh, that I, when I found out she was drinking every night in front of her children, I said, you're going to ruin your children's lives. She said, I got news for you. My children will not drink. Yeah, they will. Brenda, many, many years ago, it's been probably, let me see, honey, I'll get this straight now, probably 50 years ago, 45 years ago, everyone in her family, cousins, uncles, moms, dads, grandma, and anybody even associated with them, they all smoked. She smoked. Because they smoked. These children that watch their mommies and daddy drink every night, they're going to drink. You can't say, I'll stop it. Once they leave home, there's nothing that you can do. That's why the Bible says you need to teach your children at home all about the biblical principles and the love of Jesus Christ. Do that before they leave the house. Come on, somebody help me. Because once they're gone, folks, it's going to take a miracle from God to bring them back. It's going to take a miracle. The men, the priests of the home, since the 1950s, we have let our families down. Men aren't the priests of the homes. They're not priests anymore. Whew. I love this. I don't know if, uh, if we can go to that or not. Uh, Linda, if, you can, if we can go to First Peter, the second chapter. Verses 21, 22, and 23. I think I'm going to close here. For even unto were ye called, because Christ also suffered. And Jesus Christ left me an example that we should follow in his footsteps. And it says here in verse 22 that he did no sin, neither was there guile even found in his mouth, no bitterness whatsoever. Who, when Jesus was reviled and whipped and beaten and stripped of his clothes and made naked, he reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. But he committed himself to him that judges righteously. No matter what you're going through today, Bobby Joe, it was nothing to what my Jesus went through. He didn't revile. He didn't get bitter. He didn't get angry. You know what he said? Oh, God, forgive these folks. I don't even know what they're doing. If Jesus can do it, I can do it through him. If Jesus can do it, he said, I would be able to do greater things than even he did if I have the faith. Come on, somebody. I can be 
victorious over the secular beliefs of this world. I can live for Jesus. I can do it all because Jesus did it. And if Jesus did it, he'll give me the authority and the power that I will be able to do it. Come on. But we have to have, I, I can tell you, the only communication I have with Jesus is what they call prayer. It's a prayer line. It's that lifeline. And when I approach Jesus, all of heaven have their ears open. <laughs> That's awesome. When I, fall before, when I fall before the throne of grace, it's almost, in my eyes, and I've, I've thought this many times, as I fall before the lovely Jesus Christ, and I put my head down, in my mind's eye, I see the skies of the heavens open up, and I see God and the Son and the Spirit looking down on old Donnie boy. Come on. And if need be, they'll send an angel or two. They'll send them, if need be. If need be, they'll send somebody to help me. They'll send somebody with a word of encouragement, a word of hope. They'll send somebody to say, I've been through this before, Donnie, and through Christ I made it. You can do it through Jesus Christ. That all of heaven, their ears are open when Donnie kneels down to pray. And you know what? God allows every sinner that falls before him, all of heaven opens up. And it could be, I don't know, here I'm throwing this out there. I love to do this. Maybe when I'm in prayer, all of heaven just gets plumb quiet. <laughs> Have you ever tried to tell somebody something in the, day, in the daycare, Mike, when you come over, we're talking about Jesus? There are 29 children. They're climbing up your legs. They're picking their noses. They're thumping in their pants. They're fighting over toys. And the, the, it's so loud you can't hardly hear. But when I believe, when I speak to Jesus, all of heaven sort of quietens down. And God says, I'm going to take care of that in a way that's not just best for you, Donnie, but for everybody around you. Lovely Jesus, Heavenly Father. Whew, I know this was a teaching service today, but maybe we need it. Maybe we need to open our eyes to the fact is, even in a marriage, the man and woman have to work together to make it work. When I accepted you as my Savior, you always keep your promises. I have failed you. You have never failed me. So God, give me the strength today and everyone in this room today, everyone on the other side of them cameras, give them the strength to work hand in hand with my lovely Jesus. Oh God, I thank you for this message. It's got hope. It's encouraging. It uplifts the name of Jesus Christ. It lets us know that God and Jesus are on the same page. They feel and think just exactly alike. And their love is the same for mankind. I thank you again, Father, for this message. I thank you for the folks that came out to hear it. And Lord, those that go to the website or the telephone app site, wherever it may be, I pray that they're going to find out what a wonderful and long-suffering God that you are in the name of Jesus. Not just my creator, but my best friend. Amen.